and we see a lot of friendly faces here tonight, which I think puts the students at ease since this is their final exam for the <laughs> theater workshop. And we're so happy to have you. We hope you enjoy this shortened version of Measure for Measure. Our friend Dave Dahl, who gave us, he's a professional actor, stage manager, and director. He's done Measure for Measure seven times, and he gave us this script, helped us with our rehearsals during the last week of our uh, dress rehearsals. Unfortunately, he's not here tonight, but let's give him an applause. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the show. Happy birthday. <laughs> oh, salutations. Hast thou seen mine Instagram? I shall not regret it. Senor Lucio, this is not how you begin a play. Not in the right, mistress. <laughs> Greetings, and welcome to the Theater Productions Workshop. Yeah, yeah. Theater Workshop's production of Measure for Measure by William Shakespeare. We ask you to take this moment and please silence your cell phones. Now, Senor Lucio. Sorry, that was a pardon. Also, be aware that uh, actors will be coming up and down the center aisle, so please watch your feet. And now we invite you to please sit back and enjoy our show. My lord? Of government, the properties to unfold would seem in me to affect our speech and discourse. Since I am put to know that your own science exceeds in that, the list of all advice my friend can give you, there's our commission, from which we would not have you warp. Call hither, I say, bid, come before us, Angelo, for you must know, we have with a special soul <laughs> elected him our absence to supply, and given his deputation all organs of our own power. What think you of it? If any in Vienna be of worth to undergo such ample grace and honor, it is Lord Angelo. Look where he comes. Always obedient to your grace's will, I come to know your pleasure. Angelo, there is a kind of character in thy life that to the observer doth by history fully unfold. Therefore, in our remove, be thou at full ourself. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. Wise Aeschylus, though first in question is thy secondary. Take thy commission. Now, good my lord, let there be some more test made of my metal before so noble and so great a figure be stamped upon it. No more evasion we have with a prepared and leavened choice proceeded to you. Therefore, take your honors. Our haste from hence is so quick conditioned that it prefers itself and leaves unquestioned matters of needful value. We'll write to you as time and our concerning shall importune how it goes with us, and do look to know what doth befall you here. So, fare you well. To the hopeful executions do I leave you of your commissions. Your scope is as mine own, so to enforce or qualify the laws as to your soul seems good. Give me your hand. Once more, fare you well. The heavens give safety to your purposes. Lead forth and bring you back in happiness. I thank you. Farewell. I shall desire you, sir, to give me leave to have free speech with you. And it concerns me to look into the bottom of my place, of power which I have, but of what strength and nature I am not yet instructed. Tis so with me. Let us withdraw together, and we may soon our satisfaction have touching that point. I'll wait upon your honor. Sweep the floors, Larry. Thou art lens the toilets, Larry. Thou is not Cinderella, Larry. <sighs> well, hello, hello, oh. good man. Oh, is that thou, Lucio? Oh, thou, old woman. Pretty high, aren't you? <laughs> the twins. <laughs> oh, the twins, the brother, the sister, the family. <laughs> Not the king of Hungary. <laughs> Amen. Thou concludest like the sanctimonious pirate that went to see what the Ten Commandments but uh, scraped one under the table. Thou shalt not steal. Aye, that he raised. 
Why? It was a commandment to command the captain and all the rest from their functions. They put forth to steal. There's not a soldier of us all that in the thanksgiving before me do relish the petition well that prays for peace. Ah, oh, I never heard of any soldier whom disliked it. Oh, I believe thee, for I think thou never wast where grace was said. Oh, behold, behold, where madam mitigation comes. <laughs> I have purchased as many diseases under her roof as come to... <laughs> to what, I pray, to what? <laughs> Judge. To $5,000 a year? I and more. Oh. A French crown more. Thou art always figuring diseases in me, but thou art full of error. I am sound. Well, nay, not as one would say healthy, but uh, sound as those that are hollow. Well, thy bones are hollow. Impiety has made a feast of thee. <laughs> oh no! Which one of your hips has the most profound sciatica? <laughs> oh, that's all I wanted to tell you, man. Oh my gosh, she's so stuck up! <laughs> well, well, well. I saw one yonder arrested and carried off to prison was worth five thousand of you all. <clears throat> Who's that, I pray thee? Mary, sir, that's Claudio. Signor, Claudio. Claudio to prison? Tis not so. Nay, but I know tis so. I saw him arrested, saw him carried away, and... Which is more? Within these three days, his head to be chopped off. <laughs> but after all this fooling, I would not have it so. Art thou sure of this? I am too sure of it, and it is forgetting Madame Julietta with child. Believe me, this may be, but he promised to meet me two hours since, and he is ever precise in promise keeping. But besides, you know, it draws something new to the speech we had to such a purpose. But most of all agree with the proclamation. Away! It's going in the truth of it. to be plucked down. To the ground, mistress. Well, here is a change indeed in the Commonwealth. What's to become of me? What's to do here? Let's withdraw. Come, fear ye not. Good counselors lack no clients. Though you change your place, you need not change your trade. Here comes Signor Claudio, led by the provost to prison. Fellow, why dost thou show me thus to the world? Bear me to prison where I'm committed. I do it not in evil disposition, but from Lord Angelo by special charge. Thus can be demigod authority. Make us pay down for our offenses by weight? The words of heaven? On whom which will and will. On whom which will not, so. Yet still, tis just. But how, how Claudio? Oh, whence comes this restraint? From too much liberty, my Lucio. Liberty. Oh, if could speak so wisely under an arrest, I would send for certain of my creditors. And yet, to say the truth, I would rather have the foolishness of freedom than the morality of imprisonment. Uh, what's thy offense, Claudio? What but to speak of would offend again? Was it murder? No! Lechery? Uh, call it so. Away, sir. You must go. One word. Good friend Lucio! A word with you? A hundred if they'll do you any good. Is lechery so looked after? Thus stands it with me. Upon a true contract, I got possession of Julieta's bed. You know the lady. She's fast my wife. Save me to the denunciation lack of an outward order. This became not two, only for the propagation of a dower remaining in the coffers with friends from whom we thought it need to hide our love till time had made them for us. But to chances, to stealth our most mutual entertainment, Character too gross is writ on Julia. With child, perhaps? Unhappily, even so. But this new deputy now for the Duke. Whether tyranny be his place, or it's evidence that fills it up, I stagger in. This new governor awakes me all the enrolled penalties, which have 
like unscored armor hung by the wall so long that 19 zodiacs have gone round, and none of them have been worn. And for a name, thou puts the drowsy and the glad to act freshly on me. To surely for a name. I warrant it is. And my head stands so tickled on my shoulders that a milkmaid, if she be in love, would sigh it off. Send after the duke and appeal to him. I have done so, but he's not to be found. Oh, I pray thee, Lucio, do me this kind service. This day, my sister should be the cloister and enter, and there receive her approbation. Acquaint her with the danger of my state. For her in my voice as she make friends to the strict deputy. Bid herself a say to him. I have great hope in that. For in her youth there's a prone and speechless dialect, such as move men. And besides, she hath prosperous art when she will pay with reason and discourse, and well she can persuade. Well, I pray she may. I'll do her. Oh, thank you, good friend Lucio. Within two hours. <laughs> Come, officer. Away. No. Holy Father, throw away that thought. Believe not that the dribbling dart of love can pierce a complete bosom. Why I desire thee to give me a secret harbor hath the purpose more grave and wrinkled than the aims and ends of burning youth. May your grace speak of it. My holy sir, none knows better than you how I have ever loved the life removed and held an idle price to haunt assemblies where youth and cost and witless <coughs> bravery keeps. I have delivered to Lord Angelo a man of stricture and firm abstinence, my absolute place and power here in Vienna. And he supposed me travel to Poland, for I have strewed it in the common ear, and now it is received. Now, pious sir, you will demand me of why I do this. Gladly, my lord. We have strict statutes and most biting laws, the needful bits and curbs to headstrong weeds, which for this nineteen years we have let slip. Now, as fond fathers, having bound up the threatening twigs of birch, only to stick it in their children's sight for terror, not to use. In time, the rod becomes more mocked than fear, and so our decrees are dead to infliction, to themselves are dead, and liberty plucks justice by the nose, the baby beats the nurse, and what a thwart goes all decorum. It rested in your grace to unloose all this tied up justice when you please, and in and in you more dreadful it would seem than in Lord Angelo. I fear too dreadful. I have delivered to Lord Angelo my office, who in the ambush of my name may strike home? Yet my nature never in fight to do in slander. And to behold his sway, I will as twere a brother of your order visit both prince and people. Therefore I prithee, supply me with the habit, and instruct me how I may formally in person bear me like a true friar. Lord Angelo is precise, stands out of guard with envy, <laughs> scarce confesses that his own blood flow or that his appetite is more bread to stone. Hence shall we see, if power change purpose, what our seamers be. And have you none so further privileges? Are not these large enough? Yes, truly. I speak not as desiring more, but rather wishing a more strict restraint upon the sisterhood, the votarist of St. Clair. Oh, peace be in this place. Who's that which calls? Tis a man's voice. Gentle Isabella, turn you the key and know his business of him. You may, I may not. You are yet unsworn. Oh, peace be in this place. He calls again. I pray you, answer him. Peace and prosperity, who is that calls? <clears> Hail, <throat> hey, virgin, if you may be, as those cheek roses proclaim you are no less, can thou so stead me as to bring me to the sight of Isabella, a novice of this place and the fair sister to her unhappy brother Claudio? Her unhappy brother? Well, let me ask, I am that Isabella and his sister. Fair and gentle. Your brother kindly greets you. Uh, not to be wary of you, though, uh, he is in prison. Woe me, for what? Well, for if I were to be his judge, he would receive his punishment and thanks. He hath got his friend a child. 
Sir, make me not your story. Oh, no, no, but it is true. Your brother and his lover have embraced, as those that feed grow full, as from the as blossoming time that from the seedness the bare fallow brings to teeming poison. Even so, her plenteous womb shows his work in planting his seed. <laughs> Someone with child by him. My cousin, Juliet. Is she your cousin? Adoptively, as schoolmates change their names by way of direct affection. She it is. Well, let him marry her. Ah, but this is the point. The Duke is gone strangely from hence. Upon his place and with full line of his authority governs Lord Angelo, a man whose very blood is snow broth. One who never feels the wanton stings and motions of the sense. He hath picked out an act under whose heavy sense your brother falls into forfeit. He arrests him on it and follows closely to the rigors and statutes to make him an example. All hope is gone. Unless you, by your grace and your fair prayer, have the heart to soften Lord Angelo's heart. And that's my pith of business twixt you and your poor brother. Doth he so seek his life? Has censured it already, and as I hear, the provost hath warrant for his execution. Alas, what poor ability send me to do him good? I say the power you have. My power, alas, I doubt. Our doubts are traitors, and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Go to Lord Angelo. Make him learn to know that when maidens sue, men give like gods, and when they weep and kneel, all their petitions are as freely theirs as they themselves would owe them. I'll see what I can do. But speedily. I will about it straight. No longer see but to give the mother notice of my affair. I humbly thank you. Come in me to my brother. Soon enough I'll send him certain word of my success. I bid thee farewell. Good, sir. I do. <coughs> we must not make a scarecrow of the law, setting it up to fear the birds of prey. And let it keep one shape till custom make it their perch and not their terror. Aye, but yet let us be keen, and rather cut a little than fall and bruise to death. Alas, this gentleman whom I would say for the most noble father, let but your honor contemplate, whether you had not some time in your life ere in this night which now you sent for him, and pull the law upon you. Tis one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. You may not so extenuate his offense, for I have had such faults. But rather, tell me, when I that censure him, do so offend. Let mine own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come impartial. Sir, he must die. Be it as your wisdom will. Where is the provost? Is it your will that Claudio shall die tomorrow? Did not I tell thee, yea? Hadst thou not order? Lest I might be too rash, for I have seen, under your good correction, when... After execution, judgment hath repented o'er his doom. Go to, let that be mine. And what shall be done, sir, with the groaning Juliet? She's very near her hour. Dispose of her to some more fitter place, and that with speed. Here is the sister of the man condemned, desires access to you. Hath he a sister? Aye, my good lord, a very virtuous maid, and to be shortly of a sisterhood, if not already. Well, let her be admitted. See you, the fornicatrice, be removed. Let have needful, but not lavish means. There shall be order for it. God save your honor. Stay a little while. You are welcome. What's your will? I am a woeful suitor to your honor. Please but your honor hear me. Well, your suit? I have a vice I most do abhor, and most desire should meet the blow of justice, for which I should not plead but that I must, for which I must not plead but that I am at war twixt will and will not. Well, uh, the matter? I have a brother as condemned to die. I do beseech you, let it be his fault and not my brother. Heaven give thee moving graces. Condemn the fault but not the actor of it? Why, every fault's condemned ere it be done. Mine were the very cipher of a function to find the faults whose fine stands in record and uh, let go by the actor. Oh, just but severe law. I had a brother then. Heaven keep your honor. Not or so. To him again. Uh, entreat him. Kneel before him. Uh, hang upon his robe. You are too cold. To him I say. Must he needs die? Maiden, no remedy. Yes, I do think that you might pardon him. 
and neither heaven nor man grieve at the mercy. I will not do it. But can you if you would? Look, what I will not, that I cannot do. But might you do it, and do the world no wrong, if so your heart were touched with that remorse as mine is to him? He's sentenced. Tis too late. You are too cold. Too late? Why, no, I that do speak a word may call it back again. Believe this, if he had been as you and you as he, you would have slipped like him, but he like you would not have been so stern. Pray you be gone? I would to heaven I had your potency, and you were Isabel. Should it then be thus? No, I would tell what, what were to be a judge and what a prisoner. Aye, touch him. There's the vein. Your brother is a forfeit of the law, and you but waste your words. Alas! Alas! Be you content, fair maid. It is the law, not I, condemn your brother. Were he my kinsman, brother, or my son, it should be thus with him. He must die tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, that's so sudden. Spare him. Spare him. He's not prepared for death. Good, good, my lord, bethink you. Who is that had died for this offense? There's many have committed it. Aye, well said. The law hath not been dead, though it hath slept. Those many had not dared to do that evil if the first that did the edict and fringe had answered for his deed. Yet show some pity. I show it most of all when I show justice. Your brother dies tomorrow, be content. So you must be the first that gives the sentence that he that suffers. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant strength, but it is turned to see yourself like a giant. That is well said. Oh, to him, to him, wench, he will relent. He is coming, I perceive it. Pray heaven she win him. We cannot wear our brother with ourselves. Great men may jest with saints, tis wood in them, but in the less foul profanation. Thou art in the right, girl. More of that. That in the captain's but a choleric word, which in the soldier's flap blasphemy. Art advised on that. More on it. Why do you put these sayings upon me? Go to your bosom, knock there, and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault. If it confess a natural guiltiness such as is his, let it not sound a thought upon your tongue against my brother's life. She speaks, and tis such sense that my sense breathes with it. Fare you well. Gentle, my lord, turn back. I will bethink me. Come again tomorrow. Oh, go to. Tis well. Oh, eh? <laughs> Heaven keep your honor. Amen. For I am that way going. To temptation where prayers cross. At what time tomorrow shall I attend your lordship? At any time for noon. Save your honor. From thee. Even from thy virtue. What's this? What's this? Is this her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted who sins most? Ah, not she, nor does she tempt. Can it be that modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness? Oh, fie, fie, fie! What dost thou, or what art thou, Angelo? Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? What, do I love her? that I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes? What is thy dream on? O oh, cunning enemy, that to catch a saint, with saints dost bait thy hook. <laughs> this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Even till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. Help me, provost, so I think you are. I'm the provost. What's your will, good friar? Bound on charity in my blessed order, I come to visit the afflicted spirits here in the prison. Do me the common right to let me see them, and to make me know the nature of their crimes, that I may minister to them accordingly. I would do more than that, if more were needful. Look, here comes one now, a gentlewoman of mine, who, having fallen in the flaws of her own youth, has blistered her report. She's the child, and he that got it sentenced. A young man more fit to do another such offense than die for this. When must he die? As I do think, tomorrow. I provided for you. 
Stay a while and you'll be conducted. <laughs> Repent you, fair one, of the sin you carry. Yes, and bear the shame most patiently. Love you the man that wronged you? I do, as I love the woman that wronged him. So then it seems your most offenseful act was mutually committed. Mutually. Then was your sin of heavier kind than his? I do confess it and repent it, father. Tis me so, daughter, but lest you do repent, as the sin that hath brought you to do this shame, which sorrow is always toward ourselves, not heaven, showing we would spare heaven as we love it. I do confess it and repent it, father, and bear the shame most patiently and with joy. There rest, your partner, as I hear, must die tomorrow. <sighs> I'm going to him with instruction. Grace go with you. Benedicite. Let's die tomorrow. to several subjects, heaven hath my empty words whilst my invention, hearing not my tongue, anchors on Isabel, heaven in my mouth as if I did but only chew his name, and in my heart the strong and swelling evil of my conception. Blood, thou art blood. Let's write good angel on the devil's horns. Tis not the devil's crest. Oh, heavens. Why must my blood thus muster to my heart, making it both unable for itself and dispossessing all my other parts of necessary fitness? How now, fair maid? I am come to know your pleasure. That you might know it would much better please me than to demand what tis. <laughs> your brother cannot live. Even so. Heaven keep your honor. Yet may he live a while, and it may be as long as you or I, yet he must die. Undo your sentence. Yea? When, I beseech you, then his reprieve longer or shorter, he may be so fitted that his soul sicken not. I shall pose you quickly. Which had you rather, that the most just law now took your brother's life, or to redeem him give up your body to such sweet uncleanness as she that he hath stained? <laughs> Sir, believe this, I had rather give my body than my soul. I talk not of your soul. Our compelled sins stand more for number than for account. How say you? Nay, I'll not warrant that, for I can speak against the thing I say. Answer to this. I, now the voice of the recorded law, pronounce a sentence on your brother's life. Might there not be a charity in sin to save this brother's life? Please you to do it. I'll take it as a peril to my soul. It's no sin at all, but charity. Pleased you to do it at peril of your soul, were equal poise of sin and charity. That I do beg his life, if it be sin. Heaven, let me bear it. Nay, but hear me. Your sense pursues not mine. Either you are ignorant or seem so craftily, and that's not good. Let me be ignorant, and in nothing good, but graciously to know I am no better. Thus wisdom wishes to appear most bright when it doth tax itself as these black masks proclaim an end-shield beauty ten times louder than beauty could displayed. But mark me, to be received plain, I'll speak more gross. Your brother is to die. So. And his offense is so, as it appears, accounted to the law upon that pain. True. Admit no other way to save his life, as I subscribe not that nor any other, but in the loss of question that you his sister, finding yourself desired of such a person whose credit with the law or own great place, could fetch your brother from the manacles of the all-building law, and that there were no earthly mean to save him, but that either you must lay down the treasures of your body to this supposed, or else to let him suffer, what would you do? As much for my poor brother as myself, that is, where under the terms of death, 
The impression of king whips like wears rubies and strip myself to death, then as to a bed and long have been sick for, ere I feel my body up to shame. Then must your brother die. And tore the cheaper away. Better were a brother died at once, and that a sister, by redeeming him, should die forever. Were not you, then, as cruel as the sentence that you have slandered so? Pardon me, my lord. It often falls out. To have what we would have, we, we speak not what we mean. I somewhat do make excuses for the thing I hate, for his advantage that I dearly love. We are all frail. Else let my brother die, and let an accomplice but only he owe and succeed thy weakness. Nay, women are frail too. Women? Help heaven, men their creation more in profiting by them. And they call us ten times frail for worse stock as our complexions are, incredulous to false prints. Be that you are, that is, a woman. If you be more, you're none. If you be none, as you are well expressed by all external warrants, show it now by putting on the destined livery. I have no tongue but one. Gentle, my lord, turn back. Plainly conceive. I love you. <laughs> my brother did love Julian, and you tell me that he shall die for it. He shall not, Isabel, if you give me love. <laughs> I will proclaim the angel of look for it. Sign your present partner for my brother, or with an outstretched throne, I'll tell the world that I'm one man thou art. Who will believe thee, Isabel? My unsoiled name, the austereness of my life, my vouch against you and my place in the state, will so your accusation overweigh that you shall stifle in your own reported smell of slander. I have begun, and now I give my sensual race the rein. Fit thy consent to my sharp appetites. Lay by all niceties and prolixious blushes that banish what they sue for. Redeem thy brother by yielding up thy body to my will. Or else he must not only die the death, but thy unkindness shall his death draw out to lingering sufferance. Answer me tomorrow, or by the affection that now guides me most, I'll prove a tyrant to him. As for you, say what you can. My false overweighs your true. To whom should I complain? Did I tell this who would believe me? Oh, perilous mouse that can only tell truths of either blame and approval, asking the law to go along with their desires. Attaching both good and bad to the longing. To follow as a dross. All to my brother. Though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood, yet hath he him such a man, mind of honor. That had he twenty heads to tender down, on twenty bloody blocks he'd yield them up, before his sister should have body stooped to such a board pollution. Then Isabel lived chaste. And brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request. And fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. So then you hope of a pardon from Lord Angelo? The miserable have no other medicine but only hope. I'm hope to live and I'm prepared to die. Be absolute for death. Either death or life shall thereby be the sweeter. Reason thus with life. If I lose thee, I lose a thing that none but fools would keep. A breath thou art, servile to all sky influences that doth this habitation where thou keepest hourly afflict. Merely, thou art death's fool. I humbly thank you. Peace, hope, grace, and good company. Who's there? Come in, the wish to the welcome. Dear sir, ere long I'll visit you again. Most holy sir, I thank you. My business is a word or two with Claudia. And very welcome. Look, senor, your sister. Provost, a word with you. As many as you please. Bring me to hear them speak, where I may be concealed. Now, sister, what's the comfort? Why, as all comforts are, most good, most good indeed. 
Lord Angelo having a first to heaven intends you for his swift ambassador where you shall be an everlasting resident. Therefore, your best appointment made with speed. Tomorrow you set out. Is there no remedy? None but such remedy as to save a head. To cleave a heart of But is there any? Yes, brother, you may live. There's a devilish mercy in the judge. If you'll implore it, that will free your life, but fetter you till death. Perpetual endurance? I just perpetual endurance. But in what nature? In such one as you consenting to it. Would bark your honor from the trunk you bear and leave you naked. Let me know the point. Oh, I do fear thee, Claudio, and I quick with fright that you might cherish your feverous life. In six or seven winters more respect than a perpetual honor. There is that. Why give you me the shame? Think you I your resolution fed from flowerly tenderness? If I must die, I will encounter darkness as a bride, and hung in it in my arms. There spake my brother, there my father's grave did utter forth a voice. Yes, thou must die. This seemingly holy agent, whose unchanged appearance and carefully calculated words grips youth by the head and with foolish acts. The princely Angelo? Tis the cunning livery of hell. That damn this body to invest in covering princely guards. <laughs> there is no faith, Claudio. If I yield him my virginity, thou my <laughs> Oh, heavens! It cannot be! Yes, he would have given thee from this rank offense. <laughs> Though to offend him still. This night's the time I should do what I abhor to name. <laughs> or else thou diest to Thou shall not do it! I would burn up my life! I throw it down for your deliverance as frankly as a pin. Thanks. Dear Isabel, be ready, Claudia, for your death tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Has he affections in him that thus can make him bite the law by the nose when he would force it? Sure, tis no sin. Or the deadly seven, it tis the least. Which is the least? If he were damnable, he being so wise, why would he for the momentary trick be perturbably fine? Oh, is What says my brother? Well, death is a fearful thing! And shame life but hateful. Aye, but to die! But to go we know not where! To lie the gullum stretch and to rot! The weariest the most lulled worldly life that age, egg, penury of imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death! <laughs> Sweet sister, let me live! What sin do you do to save your brother's life? Nature dispenses with the deed so far it becomes a virtue. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, you take this coward? Oh, dishonest wretch! Will thou be made a man out of my vice? Tis not a kind of business to take life from thy own sister's shame. What should I think? No work to say. Yeah, hear me, Isabel. Fine, fine, fine! Thy sin's on accident upon a train. Mercy can be with from itself a bond. Tis best I pray. Don't hear me! Vouchsafe a word, young sister, but one word. What is your will? Might you dispense by your own leisure, I would by and by have some speech with you. The satisfaction I require is likewise your own benefit. I have no superfluous leisure. Must, my stay must be stolen from other affairs. But I will attend you a while. Son, I have overheard what hath passed between you and your sister. Angelo had never the purpose to corrupt her. He only made an essay of her virtue, to practice his laws with the disposition of natures. She, having the truth of honor in her, made him that gracious denial, which he is most glad to receive. Tomorrow you must die. Go to your knees and make ready. Let me ask my sister's pardon. I am so out of love with life. That I will sue to be rid of it. Hold you there. Farewell. Provost, a word with you. What's your will, good father? That now you are come, you will be gone. Leave me a while with the maid. My mind promises with my habit no loss shall touch it by my company. In good time.
The hand that hath made you fair hath made you good. The goodness that is cheap in beauty makes beauty brief in goodness. The assault that Angela hath made to you hath conveyed to my understanding. How will you do to content the substitute and to save your brother? I am not going to resolve him. I had rather have my brother die by the law than my son should be unlawfully born. Oh, but how much has the good duke deceived in Angelo? If ever he returned and I can speak to him, I will open my lips. That shall not be much amiss. Yet as the matter now stands, he will avoid your accusation. He made trial of you only. Therefore, fasten your ear on my advisings. To the love I have in doing good, a remedy presents itself. And you may uprightly do a poor wronged lady a merited benefit. Redeem your brother from the angry law, do no stain to your own gracious person, and much please the absent duke, if peradventure he shall ever return to have hearing of his business. Let me hear you speak farther. Have you heard speak of Mariana, the sister of Frederick, the great soldier who miscarried at sea? I have heard of the lady, and good words went with her name. She should this Angelo have married. Her brother Frederick was wrecked at sea, having in that perished vessel the dowry of his sister. There she lost a noble and a renowned brother. With him, her marriage dowry, and with both, her commented husband, this well-seeming Angelo. Is that so? Did Angelo so leave her? Left her in her tears, and dried not one of them with his comfort. But how out of this can she avail? It is a rupture you may easily heal, and the cure of it not only saves your brother, but keeps you from dishonor in doing it. Show me how, good father. This forenamed maid hath yet in the continuance of her first affection. His unjust unkindness in all reason should have quenched her love like an impediment in the current, made it more violent and unruly. Go you to Angelo, answer his requirement with a plausible obedience. Agree with his demands to the point, and only refer yourself to this advantage. First, that your stay with him may not be long. The time may have all shadow and silence in it, and the place answer to convenience. This being granted in course, it now follows all. We will advise this wronged maid to step your appointment. Go in your place. If the encounter acknowledge itself hereafter, it may compel him to her recompense. And hereby this is your brother saved, your honor untainted, the poor Mariana advantaged, and the corrupt deputy scaled. The maid will I frame and make fit for his attempt. What think you of it? Oh, the image of it gives me content already. And I trust that it'll grow to a most prosperous perfection. It lies much in your holding up. Haste you speedily to Angelo. If for this night he entreat you to his bed, give him promise of satisfaction. I will presently to St. Luke's. There at the moated grange resides this dejected Mariana. At that place, call upon me and dispatch with Angelo, that it may be quickly. I thank you for this comfort. Fare you well, good father. Oh, what news, Friar? Of the Duke. I know none. Can you tell me of any? Well, some say he is with the Emperor of Russia. Other some, he is in Rome. But where is he, think you? I know not where, but wheresoever I wish him well. <laughs> Twas a mad fantastical trick of him, to steal from the state and usurp the beggary he was never born into. Lord Angelo dupes it well in his absence. He puts transgression to it. He does well in it. A little more lenity to the lettery would do no harm in him. There's something too crabbed that way, Friar. It is too general a vice, and severity must cure it. <coughs> ah, yes. The vice is of a great kindred. It is well allied, but it is impossible to extrip it quite, Friar, till eating and drinking be put down. They say this Lord Angelo was not made by man and woman after this downright way of creation. Is it true, think you? How should he be made, then? Some report a sea maid spawned him. <laughs> Some, he was begot between two stockfishes. <laughs> but it is certain that when he makes water his urine is congealed ice. <laughs> you are, that I know to be true. You are pleasant, sir. Now speak apace. <laughs> Why, what a ruthless thing it is in him for the rebellion of a codpiece to take away the life of a man. Will the duke that is now absent have done this? Ah, he would have uh, hanged a man for getting a hundred bastards and would have paid for the nursing a thousand. He had some feeling of the sport. He knew the service, and that instructed him to mercy. I never heard the absent Duke much detected for women. Oh, sir, you are deceived. Tis not possible. Oh, who? <laughs> not the Duke? Well, yes, the Duke had crotchets in him. He would be drunk, too, that let me inform you. <laughs> you do him wrong, surely. Sir, I was an inward of his. 
A shy fellow was the Duke, and I believe I know the cause of his withdrawing. What I prithee might be the cause. Yeah, pardon. Tis a secret must be locked within the teeth and lips. But this I can let you understand. The greater file of the subject held the Duke to be wise. Wise? Why no question, but he was. A very superstitious, ignorant, unweighing fellow. Sir, this is either the envy in you, folly, or mistaking. Sir, I know him and I love him. Love talks with better knowledge, and knowledge with dearer love. <laughs> Come, sir, I know what I know. I can hardly believe that when you know now what you speak. But if ever the Duke return, I am bound to call upon you, and I pray you your name. Sir, my name is Lucio, well known to the Duke. <laughs> he shall know you better, sir, <laughs> if I may live to report you. <laughs> I fear you not. No more of this. Canst thou tell of Claudio to die tomorrow or no? Why should he die, sir? Uh, why, for filling a bottle with a tundish. <laughs> I would the Duke we talk if we're returned again. This ungenitured agent will unpeople the province with continency. Sparrows must not build in his house, for they are lecherous. Mary, this Claudio is condemned for untrusting. Go, oh good friar. I pray thee, pray for me. The Duke, I say to thee again, would eat mutton on Fridays. <laughs> He's not past it yet. <laughs> say that I said so. Farewell. No might nor greatness in mortality can cinch or escape. <laughs> Away with her to prison. Good, my lord, good to me. Thou art accounted for a merciful woman. Good, my lord. Double and trouble admonition, and still forfeit in the same kind. This would make mercy <coughs> swear and play the tyrant. A bond of eleven years' continuance, may it please your honor. My lord, this is one Lucio's information against me. Mistress Kate Keepdown was with child by him in the Duke's time. He promised her marriage. His child is a year and quarter old, come Philip and Jacob. I have kept it for him, and see how he goes about to abuse me. That fellow is a fellow of much license. Let him be called before us. Away with her to prison. Go to. No more words. Provost, my brother Angelo will not be altered. Let him be furnished with divines and have all charitable preparations. So please you, this fire hath been with him and advised him for the entertainment of death. Good even, good father. Bliss and goodness on you. Of whence are you? Not of this country. Though my chance now is to use it for my time. I am a brother of gracious order, come late from the sea of special business from his holiness. What news abroad in the world? None. But yet there is ever so great a fever on goodness that the dissolution of it must cure it. Yet the news is old enough. It is every day's news. And I pray you, madam, of what disposition was the duke? One that, above all other strifes, contended especially to know himself. What pleasure was he given to? Rather rejoicing to see another marry than marry at anything which professed to make him rejoice, a gentleman of all temperance. But let me desire to know how you find Claudio prepared. I am made to understand you have lent him visitation. He most willingly humbles himself to the determination of justice, and now is he resolved to die. You have paid the heavens your function, and the prisoner the very debt of your calling. I have labored for the poor gentleman to the extreme assure of my modesty. But my brother Justice have I found so severe that he had forced me to tell him he is indeed Justice. If his own life answer the straightness of his proceeding, it become him well. Wherein if he chance to fail, he hath sentenced himself. I am going to visit the prisoner. Fare you well. Peace be with you. He who the sword of heaven will bear should be as holy as severe. Pattern in himself to know, grace to stand, and virtue go. More nor less to others' pain than by self-offense is weighing. Shame on him whose cruel striking kills for faults of his own liking. Twice trouble shame on Angelo to weed my vice and let his grow. Oh, what may a man within him hide, though angel on the outward side?
Who's who? Very well met and well come. What is the news from this good deputy? He hath a garden circumvented with brick, whose western side is with a vineyard backed into that vineyard is a planched gate. This other made uh, his opening with this bigger key, and this other made uh, an opening to this bigger, uh, smaller door, which from the vineyard to the garden leads. There have I made my promise upon the heavy middle of the night to call upon him. With whispering and most guilty diligence, in action all a precept, he did show me the way twice over. Tis well borne up. I have not yet made known to Mariana a word of this. Come forth. I pray you, be acquainted with this maid. She comes to do you good. Take, then, this your companion by the hand, who hath a story ready for your ear. I shall attend your leisure, but make haste. The vapor sign approaches. But please you walk aside. O place and greatness, millions of false eyes are stuck upon thee. Thousands of report run with these false. Thousand escape of wits make thee the father of their idle dream and wrap thee in their fancies. Welcome. How agreed. She'll be willing to take the enterprise upon her father, if you advise it. Little have you to say when you depart from him, but soft and low, remember thou my brother. Fear me not. Nor, gentle daughter, fear you not at all. He is your husband on pre-contract. To bring you thus together, tis no sin, sith that the justice of your title to him doth flourish the deceit. Come away, our corns to reap and our tithes to sow. You called? Tomorrow morning are to die Claudio and Barney Yeah. You, Sira, provide your axe and block tomorrow four o'clock. Yes. Call hither Barney Dine and Claudio. <laughs> the one who has my pity, not a jot the other, being a murderer, though he were my brother. Come here, pretty boy. Here you go, baby. Here you go, baby. Here's the warrant, Claudio, for thy death. Tis now done midnight, and by eight of the clock tomorrow thou must be made immortal. Where's Barnadine? He's fast locked up in sleep as guiltless labor that lies starkly in traveler's bones. You will not wake. Who can do good on him? Well, go, prepare yourselves. But hark, what noise? Heaven give your spirit comfort. I hope it is some pardon or reprieve for the most gentle Claudio. Welcome, Father. The best and wholesomest spirits of the night envelop you, good provost. Who called here of late? None, since the curfew's rung. Not Isabel? No. They will then, ere it be long. Of what comfort is for Claudio? There's some in hope. He's a bitter deputy. Not so, not so. His life is parallel, even with the line and stroke of his great justice. Now are they come. This is a gentle provost, seldom, when still jailer is the friend of men. How now? What noise? The spirit's possessed with haste that wounds the unsisting postern with these strokes. There he must stay until an officer arrives to let him in. He's called up. Have you no counterman for Claudio yet, but he must die tomorrow? None, sir. None. As near the dawning, provost, as it is, you shall hear more ere morning. Happily you something know, yet I believe there comes no counterman. No such example have we. Besides, under the very siege of justice, Lord Angelo hath to the public ear professed the contrary. Here's his lordship's man. And here comes Claudio's pardon. My lord, that sent you this note, and by me further, I mean his further charge, that you swore not from the smallest sorrow of it, ne neither in time, matter, or circumstance. Good morning, for as I take it, it is almost day. I shall obey him. This is his pardon. Purchased from such sin for which the pardon himself is in. Now, sir, what news? I told you. Lord Angelo belike remiss thinking me in mine office, and awakens me with this unwanting putting on. Methinks strangely, for he hath not used it before. Pray you, let's hear it. <clears throat> Whatsoever you may hear to the contrary, let Claudio be executed by four of the clock, and in the afternoon Barnadine. For my better satisfaction, let his head be sent to me by five o'clock. Thus fail not to do your office, for you will answer it at your peril. What say you to this? What is that Barnadine to be executed in the afternoon? A bohemian born, but here nursed unbred. A prisoner that's nine years old. 
How came it that the absent duke had not either delivered him to his liberty or executed him? I have heard it was ever his manner to do so. His friend still wrought reprieves for him. Hath he borne himself penitently in prison? How seems he to be touched? A man that apprehends death no more dreadfully than in a drunken sleep. Careless, reckless, and fearless of what's past, present, or to come. Insensible of mortality, and desperately mortal. He wants advice. He'll hear none. He hath evermore had the liberty of the prison. Give him escape to leave, to leave hence, he would not. Drunk many times a day, if not many days entirely drunk. We have often awakened him, as if to carry him off to execution, and showed him a seeming ward for it. It hath not moved him at all. More of him anon. There is written in your brow, provost, honesty and constancy. I crave four days' respite, for which you are to do me a present in the dangerous courtesy. Pray, sir, in what? In the delaying death. Alack! How might I do it, with the hours limited and an express command, under penalty, to deliver his head in the view of Angelo? I might make my case to Claudius to cross this in the slightest. Let this Barnardine be in the morning executed, and his head borne to Angelo. But Angelo hath seen them both, and will discover the favor. Oh, death's a great disguiser. If anything falls you upon this, more thanks or good fortune, by the saint whom I profess, I will plead against it with my life. Pardon me, good father. It is against my oath. Were you sworn to the duke or to the deputy? To him and to his substitutes. You will think you have made no offense if the duke avouched the justice of your dealing. But what likelihood is in that? Not a resemblance, but a certainty. Look you, sir. Here is the hand and seal of the duke. In it are the contents of the duke's return. You shall anon overread it at your pleasure, for you will find within these two days he will be here. This is a thing Angela knows not, for to this very day he perceives letters of strange tenor, perchance of the duke's death, perchance entering some monastery, but by chance nothing of what is written. Call your executioner and off with Barnardine's head. I will give him a present shrift and advise him for a better place. Come away, sir. It is almost cleared on. <laughs> Master Bonadine, you must rise and be hanged. What ho, Master Bonadine? Oh, pox, they are throat. Who makes that noise there? What are you? Your friend, sir, the hangman. You must be so good, sir, to rise and be put to death. <laughs> away, you rogue, away. Ugh. I am sleepy. Pray, Master Baradine, awake till you are executed, then sleep after us. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, how now, Morrison? <laughs> What's the news with you? Truly, sir, I would desire you to clap into your prayers. For look, sir, the Lord's coming. <laughs> no! I've been drinking all night. I am not fit at work. Look, you, sir. Here comes your ghostly father. Do we just now thank you? <laughs> sir, Good. induced by my charity in hearing how hastily you are to depart, I come to advise you, comfort you, and pray with you. Uh, not I. I've been drinking all night. And I will have more time to prepare me, or else they will beat out my brains with billets. <laughs> I will not consent to die today, that is certain. Oh, sir, but you must, and I beseech you, look forward on the journey you will go. I swear I will not die today by any man's persuasion. But hear you! Not a word. If you have anything to say to me, come to my ward. Prince, not I, today. <laughs> Unfit to live or die. I can change that. Oh, well, not. <laughs> After him, bring him to the block. <laughs> A creature, unprepared, <laughs> unmeet for death. To transport him in the mind he is in were damnable. Here in the prison, good father, there died this morning of a cruel fever one Ragazine, a most notorious pirate, a man just of Claudio's years, and his head and his beard just of his color. 
What if we do therefore satisfy the deputy with the visage of one magazine, much like to Claudio? Oh, tis, an accent that heaven provides. Dispatch it presently. It shall be done, good father, presently. But Barnardine must die this afternoon. And how shall we continue Claudio to save me from the dangers that might come if he were not alive? Let this be done. Put them in secret holds, both Barnardine and Claudio. The son heir twice made to his journal greeting, you shall find your safety manifested. I am your free dependent. Go, dispatch it, and send the head to Angelo. Now, will I send letters to Angelo? Him I'll desire to meet me at the consecrated fount. At the city gate. Here's the head. I'll carry it myself. Convenient it is. Make a swift return, for I would commune with you of such things that want no ear but yours. I'll make all speed. Peace out, be here. The tongue of Isabel. She's come to know if yet her brother's pardon me come hither. I will keep her ignorant for, for her own good, to make her heavenly comforts of despair when it is least expected. Oh, by your leave. Good morning to you, fair and gracious daughter. The better, given to me by so holy a man. Have you the deputy send my brother's pardon? He hath been released, Isabel, from the world. His head is off and sits to Angelo. Nay, but it is not so. It is no other. Show your wisdom, daughter, and your close patience. Oh, I will to him and pluck out his eyes. No, you shall not be admitted to a sight. Unhappy Claudio, wretched Isabel, injurious world most damned Angelo. This nor hurts him, nor profits you a jot. Forbear it, therefore, give your cause to heaven. The duke comes home tomorrow. Nay, dry your eyes. Aeschylus and Angelo meet him at the gates. There to give up their power. If you can, pace your wisdom in that good path I wish it go. I am directed by you. This letter, then, to Friar Peter give. Tis that he sent me of the Duke's return. Say by this token, I desire his company at Mariana's house tonight. Her cause and yours I'll perfect him withal, and he shall bring it before the Duke, and to the head of Angelo accuse him home and home. For my poor self, I'm combined by a sacred vow and shall be absent. <clears throat> when do this letter, command these spreading waters from your eyes, and with a light heart, trust not only my holy order if I pervert your course. Who's here? Ah, good evening, Friar. Who is the Travis? Not within, sir. Oh, pretty Isabella. I'm pale at my heart to see thine eyes so red. Uh, but they say the Duke will be here tomorrow. By my troth, Isabel, I love thy brother. If the old fantastical Duke of Dark Corners had been at home, he would have lived. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, the Duke is marvelous that will be holding to your report. But the best is, he lives not in them. Friar, thou knowest not the Duke as well as I do. <laughs> he is a better woodsman than thou takest him for. <laughs> well, you'll answer this one day. Fare you well. Nay, Terry, I'll come along with thee. I can tell thee pretty tales of the Duke. You have told me too many of him already, <laughs> sir, if they be true, if not true. None were enough. I was once before him forgetting your wench with child. Did you such a thing? Ah, yes. Mary did I, but uh, I was fain to forswear it. Else they would have married me to the rotten meddler. Sir, your company is fairer than honest. Rest you well. These letters at fit time deliver me. The provost knows our plot and purpose. The matter being afoot, keep your instruction and hold you ever to our special drift. Every letter he has writ has discredited another. And why meet him at the gates and re-deliver our authorities there? I guess not. And why should we proclaim it in an hour before his entering that if any crave redress of injustice, they should exhibit their petitions in the street. He shows his reason for that, to have a dispatch of complaints and to deliver us from devices hereafter, which shall then have no power to stand against us. Well, I beseech you, let it be proclaimed betimes in the morn. I shall, sir. Fare you well. Good night. Ah, this deed unshapes me quite, makes me unprepared and dull to all proceedings. A deflowered maid, and by an eminent body that enforced the law against it. But 
that her tender shame will not proclaim against her maiden loss. How might she tongue me? Yet reason dares her no. Would yet he had lived. Alack, when once our grace we have forgot, nothing goes right. We would and we would not. My very worthy cousin, fairly met. Our wise and faithful friend, we are glad to see you. Happy return thee to your royal grace. <laughs> Give me your hand and let the subject see. Come, Aeschylus, you must walk by us on our other hand. And good supporters are you. Now is your time. Speak loud and kneel before him. Justice, O royal duke. Veil your regard upon a wronged. I would fain have said a maid. O worthy prince, dishonor not your eye by throwing it on any other optic till you have heard me in my true complaint and given me justice, 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 justice. Relate your wrongs in what? By whom? Be brief. Here is Lord Angelo shall give you justice. Reveal yourself to him. O worthy duke, you bid me seek redemption of the devil. Hear me yourself, for that which I must speak must either punish me, not being believed, or wring redress from you. Hear me, O oh, hear me here. My lord, her wits, I fear me, are not firm. She hath been a suitor to me for her brother, cut off by course of justice. By course of justice. And she will speak most bitterly and strange. Most strange, but yet most truly will I speak. That Angelo's forsworn, is it not strange? That Angelo's a murderer, is it not strange? That Angelo's an adulterous thief, an hypocrite, a virgin violator, is it not strange and strange? Away with her, poor soul. She speaks this in the infirmity of sins. O oh, prince, I conjure thee, as thou believes there is another comfort than this world, that thou neglect me not with that opinion that I am touched with madness. Tis impossible but one. The wicked wretch on the ground may seem as shy, as grave, as just, as absolute as Angelo. Even so may Angelo, in all his dressings, characters, titles, forms, may be an arch villain. By mine honesty, if she be mad, as I believe no other, her madness hath the oddest frame of sense. I am the sister of one Claudio, condemned upon the act of fornication, to lose his head, condemned by Angelo. I, a probation of a sisterhood, was sent to by my brother. One Lucio has sent the messenger. Not I, and to it like your grace. Let's see the messenger. You were not bid to speak. No, my lord, nor wished to hold my peace. I wish you now, then, Pray you take note of it. And when you have a business for yourself, pray heaven you then be perfect. I warrant, Your Honor. The warrant's for yourself. Take heed to it. This gentleman told somewhat of my tale. Right. It may be right, but you were in the wrong to speak before your time. <laughs> Proceed. I went to this pernicious wretch deputy. That's somewhat madly spoken. Pardon it, the phrase is to the matter. Mend it again. The matter. Proceed. In brief, to set the needless process by, for which this was of much length, the vile conclusion. He would not but by gift to my chaste body to his never-ending intemperate loss release my brother. And this was of much debatement, but my sisterly, sisterly remorse confutes mine honor, and I did yield to him. But the next morbid times, he sends a warrant for my poor brother's head. This is most likely. That it were as likely as it is true. By heaven, fond wretch, thou knowest not what thou speakest or else thou art to burn against himself in hateful practice. First, his integrity stands without blemish. Next, if he had so offended, he would have weighed thy brother by himself and not have cut him off. And is this all? Then I thus wronged hence unbelieved go. I know you'll fain be gone. Shall we thus permit a blasting and a scandalous breath to follow him so near us? This needs must be a practice. Who knew in your intent and coming hither? One that I would wear here. For I Lodowick. A ghostly father, belike. Who knows that, Lodowick? Uh, my lord. <laughs> uh, I know him. Tis a meddling friar. I do not like the man. For had he been lay, my lord, for certain words he spake against you in your retirement, I would have swinged him soundly. Words against me? This is a good friar, belike. And to set on this wretched woman here against our substitute. Let this friar be found. But yesternight, my lord, she and that friar, 
I saw them at the prison. A saucy friar. A very scurvy fellow. <laughs> Bless be your royal grace. I've stood by, my lord, and I've heard your royal ear abused. First half, this woman most wrongfully accused your substitute. Who is as free from touch or soil with her as she from one on God? We did believe no less. Know you that Friar Lodewick she speaks of? I know him for a man divine and holy. But at this moment, my lord, he is sick and of a strange fever. Upon his mere request, I came hither as to speak from his mouth. First, for this woman, to justify this lord, so vulgarly and personally accused. Her shall you hear set upon. Her shall you hear disapprove to her eyes, till she herself confess it. Good friar, let's hear it. Do you not smile at this, Lord Angelo? Oh, the vanity of wretched fools! Bring us some seats. Come, cousin Angelo, in this I'll be impartial. Be you judge of your own cause. Is this the witness, friar? First, let her show her face and after speak. Pardon, my lord, but I will not show my face until my husband bid me. What? Are you married? No, my lord. Are you a maid? No, my lord. A widow, then? Neither, my lord. Why, then you are nothing, neither maid, widow, nor wife? Uh, my lord, she may be a punk, for many of them are neither maid, widow, nor wife. Silence that fellow! I would he have some cause to prattle for himself. Well, my lord. I confess, my lord, that I ne'er was married, and I confess besides that I am no maid. I have known my husband, though my husband knows not that he ever knew me. He was drunk then, my lord. It can be no better. For the benefit of silence, would thou work so too? <laughs> well, my lord. This is no witness for Lord Angelo. I come to it now, my lord, that she that accuses him of, self, of fornication in self-same manner does accuse my husband, and accuses him of such a time that I'll dispose I had him in mine arms with all the effects of love. Charges she more than uh, me? Not that I know. No? You say your husband. Why, just so, and that is Angelo, who thinks he ne'er knew my body, but thinks... <laughs> He knows, he thinks, that he knows Isabel's. This is a strange abuse. Let's see thy face. My husband bid me. Now will I, I will unmask. This is the face, thou cruel Angelo, that once thou sworest was worth the looking on. This is the hand which with a vowed contract was fast to be locked in thine. This is the body that took away from Isabel's imagined person and did supply thee in thy garden house. In her place. Know you this woman? Cardinally, she says. Zero, no more. <laughs> Enough, my lord. My lord, I must confess, I know this woman. And five years since there was some speech of marriage betwixt myself and her, which was broke off. Since which time of five years I never spake with her, saw her, nor heard from her, upon my faith and honor. Noble prince, as light comes from heaven and word from breath, as there is sense in truth and truth in virtue, I am affianced this man's wife, as strongly as words can form vows. And, my good lord, but Tuesday night last gone in Garden's house, he did know me as a wife. As this is true, let me in safety arise from my knees, or else forever be confixed here, a marble monument. I did but smile till now. Now, good my lord, give me the scope of justice. My patience here is touched. Let me have way to find this practice out. I, with my heart, and punish them to your height of pleasure. Thinkest thy oaths or testimonies against his worth and credit that sealed in approbation? You, Lord Aeschylus, sit with my cousin. Lend him your kind pains. There is another friar that set them on. Let him be sent for. Would he be here, my lord, for he hath set the women on to this complaint. Your provost knows the place where he abides, and he may be fetched. Go do it instantly. And you, my noble, well-warranted cousin, to whom it concerns to hear this matter forth, do with your injuries as seems you best. In any chastisement, I for a while will leave you, but stir not 
till you have well determined upon these slanders. My lord will do it thoroughly. Signor Lucio, did not you say you knew this Friar Lodewick to be a dishonest person? And one that hath spoke most villainous speeches of the Duke. We shall entreat you to abide here till he call and enforce them against him. We shall find this Friar a notable fellow. As any in Vienna, on my word. My lord, here comes the rascal of which I spoke of here with the provost. In very good time. Speak not you to him till we call upon you. Mum. <laughs> Come, sir. Did you set these women on to slander, Lord Angelo? They have confessed you did. Tis false. Where is the duke? Tis he should hear me speak. The duke's in us, and we will hear you speak. Look, you speak justly. Boldly, at least. Is the duke gone? Then is your cause gone, too? The duke's unjust to retort your manifest appeal and put the trial in the villain's mouth for which you come here to accuse. To the rack with him! We'll tell you joint by joint, but we will know his purpose. What unjust? Be not so hot. The duke dare no more stretch this finger of mine than he dare rack his own. My business in this state made me a looker on here in Vienna, where I have seen corruption boil and bubble till it overrun the stew. Slander to the state! What can you vouch against him, Senor Lucio? Is this the man that you did tell us of? Tis he, my lord. Come hither, good man, Volpate. Do you know me? I remember you, sir, by the sound of your voice. I met you in the prison, in the absence of the duke. Oh, did you so? And do you remember what you said of the duke? Most notedly, sir. Do you now? And was the duke a fleshmonger, a fool, and a coward, and then, you, and then you reported him to me? You must, sir, change persons with me, ere make that my report when you spoke so of him. Much more, much worse. Oh, thou terrible fellow! <laughs> Did I not pluck thee by the nose for thy speeches? I protest I love the duke as I love myself. Hark, <laughs> how the villain would close now after his treasonable abuses. That fellow is not to be talked with all. Away with him to prison. Where is the provost? Away with him to prison. Stay, sir, stay a while. What? Resists he? Help him, Lucio. Come, sir. Come, sir. Come, sir. Uh, oh, sir! Why, you must be hooded, must you? Show your knave's visage with a pox to you! Show your sheep fighting face and be hanged in her! Will I not off? <laughs> <laughs> Thou art the first knave that ever madest a duke. First, Provost, I will bail these gentle three. Sneak not away, sir, for you and the fry will have a word anon. Oh, lay hold on him. This may prove worse than hanging. <laughs> what you have spoke, I pardon. Sit you down. We'll borrow place of him. Sir, by your leave, hast thou a word, or wit, or impudence that yet can do the office? Oh, my dread lord, I should be guiltier than my guiltiness. To think I can be undiscernible when I perceive your grace like power divine hath looked upon my passes. Then, good prince, no longer session hold upon my shame, but let my trial be mine own confession. Immediate sentence then and sequent death is all the grace I beg. Come hither, Mariana. Say, wast thou ever contracted to this woman? I was, my lord. Go, take her hence, and marry her instantly. Friar, do the office. Provost, go with him. <laughs> my lord, I am more amazed at his dishonor than at the strangeness of it. Dear Isabel, your friar is now your prince, as I was advertising and holy to your business, not changing heart with habit. I am still attorney at your service. Oh, pardon me, my lord, that I, your vassal, have employed and paid your own sovereignty. You are pardoned, Isabel. For this new married man approaching here, the mercy of the law cries out, and most audible even from his proper tongue, an Angelo for Claudio, 
death for death. Haste still pays haste, and leisure answers leisure. Like dog quit life, and measure still for measure. We do condemn thee to the very block where Claudio stooped to death, and with like haste, away with him. Oh, my most gracious lord, I hope you will not mock me with a husband. It is your husband mocked you with the husband. And for his possessions, although by confiscation they are ours, we do in state and widow you withal to buy you a better husband. <laughs> I pray no other nor no better man. <laughs> Away with him to death. Oh, my good lord, sweet Isabel, lend me your knee. And all my life to come, I will lend you all my life to do you service. Against all sense do you importune her. No, oh, sweet Isabel, do yet but take my part. Kneel down by me, lift up your hands, say nothing, I will say all. They say that best men are molded out of faults, and for the most become much more the better for being a little bad. So may my husband. Sweet Isabel, you not lend to me. He dies for Claudio's death. Most bounteous sir, look, if it please you on this man condemned, as if my brother lived, my brother had by justice in that he did the thing for which he died. As for Angelo, his bad intent does not overtake it, and must be buried but as an intent, intent but merely thoughts. Merely, my lord. Your suit's unprofitable. Stand up. I have bethought me of another fault. Provost, how came it Claudio was beheaded at an unusual hour? It was commanded so. Had you a special warrant for the deed? No, my good lord, it was by private message. For which I do discharge you of your office. Give up your keys. Pardon me, noble lord. I thought it was a fault, but knew it not. Yet did repent me, after more advice, for testimony whereof, one in the prison, who should by private order else have died, I preserved alive. What's he? His name's Barnadine. I would have done so by Claudio. Go fetch him hither. Let me look upon him. I'm sorry. One so learned and so wise as you, Lord Angelo, have still appeared. You should slip so grossly both in the heat of blood and lots of tempered judgment afterward. I am sorry that such sorrow I procure. Is that Barnadine? Here, my lord. Zira, thou art said to have a stubborn soul that apprehends no further than this world, and squarest thy life according. Thou art condemned, but for those earthly faults I quit them all, and pray thee the mercy to provide for, for better times to come. Friar, advise him. I leave him to your hand. Why mock you the fellow? <laughs> For he is very like, said Claudio, as much like to Claudio as himself. <gasps> Isabel! If he be like your brother, for his sake is he pardoned. And for your lovely sake, give me your hand and say you will be mine. Oh. <laughs> he is my brother too, but better time for that. By this, does Lord Angelo conceive you safe. Look that you love your wife, her worth worth yours. I find an app remission in myself, and yet there's one in place I cannot pardon. You, Zira, that is looking for a fool, a coward, one of all luxury, an ass, a madman. For in I so deserved of you, you extol me thus? Uh, faith, my lord, I spoke it but uh, according to the trick. If you will hang me for it, you may. But I would rather it pleased you that I might be whipped. <laughs> whipped first, sir, and hanged after. So <laughs> wait, Provost, round about the city. Is there any woman wronged by this lewd fellow? As I have heard himself swear, there's one whom he begot with child. Let her appear, and he shall marry her. Oh, no, I beseech thee, my lord. Do not marry me to a whore. I, your highness said even now, I made you a duke. Oh, good, my lord, please do not recompense me in making me a cuckold. Upon mine honor, thou shalt marry her. 
Thy slanders I forgive, and therewithal remit thy other forfeits. But marrying a punk, my lord, is pressing to death, whipping, and hanging. Slandering a prince deserves it. <laughs> she, Claudio, that you wrong. Look, you restore. Joy to you, Mariana. Love her, Angela. Thanks for thy much goodness. And thank you, Provost, for thy much care and secrecy. We shall employ thee in a worthier place. Thou art not make them like they used to be. <laughs> thank you, Friar. <laughs> Dear Isabel, I have a motion that much imports your good. Whereto, if you'll a willing ear incline, what's mine is yours, and what is yours is mine. So bring us to our palace, where we shall find that's meet you all should know. for the rest of the cast, you are welcome to do that. <laughs> With 19 ship shipments of 1999. <laughs> Free shipping not included. Let's give a round of applause for our lovely teacher, Lucinda. Yeah. <laughs> this is extremely awkward. Yeah. <laughs> 